Right, well, I think we'll start. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charles Streeton. I'm a barrister at Francis Taylor Building, as I suspect uh, everyone watching uh, is aware. Uh, and this webinar is about major London development and in particular the importance of uh, plan-led design. Uh, just by way of housekeeping, I believe that the chat function is enabled. So if people want to have an ongoing discussion during the webinar, uh, they can use that chat function. Um, otherwise, by all means, use the Q&A function to put questions in. Uh, and when I finished uh, giving the webinar, I'll have a look at those and try to answer some of the questions uh, that have been asked. In terms uh, of the inspiration for this talk, um, I think it's fair to say that we have recently seen uh, some fairly high profile casualties uh, of poor design uh, in the planning system. I mean, one might say that the real casualty, of course, uh, are the buildings which are built that should never have been built. And I put uh, on the slide there a picture of the St George's Wharf development, which has twice been voted the ugliest building uh, in the world. Uh, but recently, I think poor design has found it much harder uh, to gain its consent. And examples of some of the high profile casualties uh, we have seen would be cases like the Chiswick Curve appeal, which was dismissed the Camberwell Union uh, appeal, which was dismissed, and the Charlton Riverside appeal, uh, which was dismissed, all of them uh, by and large because of the design uh, of the building. And so the, the thesis really lying behind this webinar is that there has been a significant shift in emphasis uh, towards uh, good design, uh, and that that has become an increasingly important part uh, of promoting a building, particularly uh, very large central London development, which is either called in or recovered by the Secretary of State for um, consideration. And I thought of when I was putting this together about um, why good design wasn't necessarily something one had always uh, considered to be crucial to planning, because really in policy terms it is. And when I was looking at uh, some of the background materials, in particular the report uh, produced by the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. One of the quotes that they have there stuck out, which was some house builders believe they can build it, any old crap and still sell it. And I think probably there's there's truth in that. Uh, the system that we operate in, and in particular the times we operate in, where there's a housing crisis, there is a strong imperative uh, towards building, uh, and in particular in to towards building homes. But that, um, I think it's now accepted, should not be at the cost of good design, although perhaps um, previously uh, it has been. And when I started to think about that, I remembered that actually um, design is always really something which has been at the very heart of the planning system. Uh, and there's an article I wrote with Greg Jones a few years ago about the history of uh, town and country planning. And in the course of that, we looked at uh, the, the real root of town and country planning in the 1909 Planning Act. And of course, one of the objectives of that was to secure, as it's put, the home healthy, the house beautiful, the town pleasant and the city dignified. And if that's not about um, design and, and beauty in design terms, then it's difficult to know what is. And, and the thread that comes from the 1909 Act is still very much uh, in play in national planning policy, in particular, the suite of design policies in the MPPF. Uh, MPPF 124 makes very, very clear that the creation of high quality buildings and places is fundamental to what the planning and development process is supposed to achieve. Uh, and indeed, there is an injunction in paragraph 130 of the framework against granting planning permission uh, for poor design. Nevertheless, uh, the fact remains that I think there have been some buildings consented uh, in recent years, which, which perhaps do not fully meet um, that aspiration. And I think that there was a concern uh, within government that there was a disconnect between the uh, high ideals of the system and what it was uh, achieving. In light of that, in 2020, the government commissioned the um, Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission to produce its report entitled Living with Beauty, Living with Beauty which aimed to bring the concept of beauty um, back into the planning system. Uh, it was produced by a panel of experts, including amongst them uh, Nicholas Boyce Smith, who's the chief executive of Create Streets. I've worked with him on a number of projects. He's someone with a genuine passion for um, designing good working places. Uh, and I think that the report uh, speaks very much to the credit of its authors in that it has come up with a, 
a strong and new way of reinvigorating the question of design uh, within the planning system. And it has three principles at its key. Uh, the first is to ask for beauty. The second is to refuse ugliness. And the third is to promote stewardship. And I just like to look at each of those objectives uh, in turn and see how they uh, can form a part of the planning system. The first of those asking for beauty, I think is particularly notable. I was at a planning inquiry about A. Talbot Embankment, a big central London um, tall building scheme recently. And Rupert Warren, who was uh, on the other side from me, he was promoting the scheme for the developer eyes for Westminster, um, made a submission that the building they were promoting was beautiful. And he said that's not a submission he could have seen himself making even a couple of years ago. And I'm inclined to agree with that. It's a, it's a relatively new word uh, when you're a planning inquiry, a word like beauty. Uh, and it's because I think it seems highly subjective. I know that um, Fiona Reynolds, the former director general of the National Trust, now one of the masters of a Cambridge college, um, described the word beauty as previously carrying somewhat elitist connotations. And I think describing a building as beautiful was seen as insufficiently objective, too subjective a term, and therefore not useful in a planning uh, context, almost a dirty word. But actually, I think um, the way in which the commission have approached it makes a lot of sense. It divides beauty essentially into three. At the heart of it, it has um, what we would probably call detailed design, beautiful buildings, window treatments, materials, proportions, and spaces. Uh, and then at a, a next level of the shell, it deals with beautiful places. Again, as a plan, you might think of that as place making the streets, squares, and parks. And then above that, um, beautiful placing, the location of buildings. And again, that's a big part of how planning works is to uh, appropriately zone, as the Americans call it, development to make sure that it's not just an attractive building, but it's an attractive building uh, in its context in the local space. Uh, and so I think it is helpful to look at beauty and to realize that it is objectifiable, as the commission says, uh, and indeed to say it should be an essential condition uh, for the grant of planning permission. By contrast, um, the commission referred to refusing ugliness. Uh, and I think it's very interesting the way that they define ugliness, because they don't just say it's unsightly. In fact, unsightly isn't the first word that they use when they talk about ugliness. Um, what they do is refer to ugly, ugliness as being buildings which are unadaptable, unhealthy and unsightly. They're buildings with uh, no real lifespan, which, as it's put here, violates the context in which they are placed. Uh, and I think the example that they give in the report of a Toys R Us as against a conventional uh, British high street is, is a powerful one. We're all used to um, driving past industrial estates, seeing the now empty or boarded up Toys R Us building, seeing the way in which um, life has changed, in which uh, direct to door last mile delivery has become the norm and superstores certainly um, during the pandemic, but in fact long before the pandemic were uh, starting to fold. Uh, and buildings which simply are large monoliths, which as it's put in the report, destroy the sense of place, um, are readily identifiable as ugly. And I don't think there's any problem um, with branding them as such. The third of the principles then, I think really in some ways ties the first two together and it's perhaps the most important. What the commission says is that a beautiful building, um, a, an important building should promote stewardship and they refer to the scandal of abandoned places. And I was reminded by that um, of the Banksy Western Supermare uh, sort of life imitating art, art imitating life, having Dismaland, where um, it was a sort of defunct fun fair, which he used as a social commentary on uh, defunct buildings. And I think that the point that that makes and the point that the report makes is right, is that good design needs to be timeless. It needs to be enduring. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, that it's unsustainable to have uh, the equivalent of a Primark throwaway pair of shoes in building terms. Buildings need to be capable of outlasting generations and, and all great buildings, I think, do do that. And ultimately, um, the best of them are listed to preserve them for the fullness of time. So the three um, planks of the report, uh, promoting beauty, uh, avoiding ugliness and promoting stewardship, are, I think, um, a relatively new way of looking at design. Uh, in 2020, as it then was when that report was published. 
Uh, the government has responded to that with the National Design Guide in January 2021, which I suspect uh, anyone watching this will um, be very familiar with. There are 10 key principles to it, and I don't propose uh, to go through all of them. What I want to do is to look uh, at each of them, uh, and they're there on the slide, and in particular to look at them in the context of the new London plan, which was adopted on the 2nd of March, so very recently uh, indeed and to see how um, design is treated in the new London plan uh, with reference to some of those national design guide principles uh, and then uh, to look perhaps at some case studies and how uh, they apply in practice. The first and perhaps the most important principle in the national design guide is the importance of context and that's a principle which we also see very much reflected in the framework there's paragraphs 125 and 127 on the slide, which essentially make clear the importance of taking into account the surrounding built environment, including its history, history and discouraging uh, inappropriate change, but rather than, um, but rather promoting an appropriate and new um, response to that character, which is in keeping uh, with it. And something that I have tended to find uh, when I've dealt with design cross-examination is that there's often an alarming absence of care taken um, with a contextual townscape assessment when promoting a building. And I put uh, an example of that on the slide. That's a building which um, I'm pleased to say doesn't exist. Uh, it was the proposed 9 to 42, the Broadway Ealing redevelopment, which essentially involved um, the complete demolition of a conservation area, including uh, a jazz club where the Rolling Stones, I think it was the Rolling Stones, perhaps the Who had first um, played a gig. And what was said um, by the architect, who I won't name, was this is a um, very much contextual development which responds massively to the part of Ealing in which it's found, and it has all these nods to the design of Ealing. Um, but there was le very little of that actually to be found in the design of, of the buildings themselves. And, and a notable example of that um, was if you look on the top of those uh, run of three tall buildings, these lodges that were being proposed. And that was said to be a response um, to the local vernacular architecture in Ealing. Um, but in fact, when my clients went away and did some analysis of other schemes promoted uh, by the same uh, architects, those lodges appear on a great number of those buildings, some in other parts of London, um, and some much further afield, including in Beirut. And I think the potential embarrassment of that sort of point being made in cross-examination really re-emphasizes the importance of properly conducting a townscape analysis uh, and of properly assessing local character and of properly embedding that into the design of a building uh, before you find yourself um, promoting the planning application. Now, the importance of contextual understanding uh, is now front and center in the design policies uh, in the new London plan, in particular uh, policy D1, which makes clear that uh, to promote a well-designed development, you need to understand the area's capacity uh, for growth. Um, and in doing so, you need to understand its character. Um, but what I think is most interesting about new London plan policy D1 um, is that it makes clear that respecting character and accommodating change are not two mutually exclusive objectives. And I think too often they are seen as that. They are in fact two sides of the same coin. Once you understand what the character of an area is, uh, how it works, what's important about it, then you also understand what its capacity to accommodate new development is, which parts of it uh, are appropriate for more dense development, which parts of it are more sensitive, and what the stylization of that development should be, whether it reacts to its context uh, by seeking in some way to make references to it, or whether it deliberately reacts against it and creates something uh, new and different. So I think um, New Land and Plan Policy D1, and in particular the way it uh, deals with the, con the concepts of change and character and capacity for growth, uh, is very much uh, interesting and very much a response to uh, that principle uh, of embedding good design in a contextual analysis. Uh, another point which I wanted to deal with here is, of course, that front and center um, of the totally new policies in the London plan is this principle of the agent of change, which the mayor has very proudly given its own policy. Um, and I think that's something which needs to be taken into account whenever a building is designed. Uh, the building in the background on this slide 
is the Lyle Park development that um, with one of the silks in Chambers I advised on the agent of change principle uh, in relation to. And um, it's a major uh, Docklands redevelopment right next to the old Tate and Lyle um, sugar factory, which is still very much an industrial working premises and the backbone of a, of a major British company. Uh, and so one of the issues faced by the developer there was making sure that they could respond to the neighbouring um, industrial use, which is an important part of London's economy um, and which certainly no one wished to interfere with, whilst at the same time um, promoting a major housing development uh, in what is a very sustainable location. Uh, and that's not uh, an easy challenge to meet, but it's one I think that uh, London's uh, buildings are very much having to meet and London's design is very much having to meet these days. The new London plan is clear um, that there needs to be a greater degree of co-location. Um, and the agent of change principle uh, is one of the key ways of doing that. And all it does is place the emphasis on the developer um, to mitigate the impacts of existing noise or other nuisance generating activities like smoke, smell, dust. Uh, upon the development proposed. And again, if there's a proper contextual analysis at an early stage, if the building design takes into account where those noise generating uses are and how to mitigate them and how still to create adequate um, or better than adequate um, living environment for residents of the proposed building, then the, the policy will do its job. The problem arises when that um, doesn't happen. In light of that uh, context, I now want to look uh, at uh, what good design actually is uh, in New London Plan policy terms and how that's achieved. And in terms of uh, what it is, it's policy D3, which really defines um, good design. And there are four uh, aspects to it. Firstly, taking a design-led approach. Secondly, uh, ensuring an appropriate form and layout. Thirdly, ensuring that the experience of the building uh, is an appropriate one. Uh, and finally, making sure that the quality and character uh, of the building or site uh, is of the highest possible quality. And what I think uh, is interesting about policy D3 is that it refers uh, repeatedly to optimizing uh, site capacity. And that's very frequently relied upon as a basis to seek to maximize uh, the quantum of development on a site. But I do think it's important to distinguish those two at inquiry, the number of times where uh, the question ends up being put, well, you're not really optimizing here, you're maximizing. Um, of course, uh, the plan, as all uh, development plans do, is seeking to achieve as much uh, development appropriately as possible, but that's not at any cost. Um, what it's seeking to do is achieve uh, a design which responds to uh, the location of the development, responds to uh, its sustainability as a location responds to its context and which provides uh, the best possible use of the site. So that's uh, as much development as is appropriate. And I think often um, optimizing as a concept gets lost uh, when one deals with good design. And so it's something I really wanted to uh, stress uh, in the course of this um, talk. And I can think of a number of examples of cases where um, attempts to maximize have really uh, undermined the development uh, entirely. And one of those I think would be um, the Camberwell Union case that I'm going to talk about later. Um, and certainly uh, the case in Guildford that I'll talk about as a case study at the end also um, falls down on that same uh, hurdle. Uh, the next uh, issue uh, is how you deliver that good design. Um, and there are essentially uh, two key aspects to that. One is uh, before the event and the other is after the event. The first is the exploration of options. And we see this in uh, policy D4 of the new London plan. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of stakeholder engagement and the use of appropriate um, design tools when a building uh, is being developed. And that of course includes engagement with statutory consultees. Um, the building that you can see in the background on the right of this slide, which uh, abuts directly the um, Victoria Tower of the Palace of Westminster, uh, is 8 Albert Embankment, which is presently uh, a case before the Secretary of State for his um, decision. And one of the things that mo was most interesting during the inquiry uh, in that case is that initially Historic England had raised no objection to the proposal. Um, 
but Westminster, my client, did raise an objection on the basis of essentially uh, this photograph you can see in another uh, view. This is one of the uh, LVMF strategic views uh, of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the development is relatively prominent behind the palace. Uh, once that was drawn uh, to the attention of Historic England, um, they had a rather different consultation uh, position. And it emerged that what had happened was when the building was initially designed, uh, it was significantly shorter than it is uh, in uh, the view that you can see there. But there had been uh, a requirement by the London Borough of Lambeth for additional affordable housing. And the building's architect had essentially um, added the additional floors on top of the building that had first been designed. And that's what largely resulted in uh, the protrusion into this view that we can see. And I think that um, when that came out through the course of the inquiry, it was a relatively uncomfortable moment for the architect because he was having to accept that um, the height of the building was driven not by um, his contextual analysis, not by his understanding of the streetscape or townscape character, uh, but by the desire simply to build up to provide um, more development. And I think that that's really the sort of point that one wants to be very careful to avoid. Uh, and similarly, I think it's very important to use all of the tools available to conduct your analysis before you find your planning application uh, coming under scrutiny. Uh, two examples of that in relation to this 8 Albert embankment um, building. Uh, the first was that the photo montages originally provided uh, had, a, um, had some foliage screening this view. Uh, and it, the, 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 the scheme was promoted through the local planning authority uh, and GLA stage entirely on the basis um, that there was very little impact to that view because it was screened by the tree. But if you um, had conducted uh, the view without using the tree as screening, um, then quite a different impact uh, in the view at least of Westminster emerged. And the LVMF specifically said that the tree should be cut back so as to preserve the view and managed. And indeed the City of London uh, who managed um, Hampstead Heath uh, had, had um, accepted that it needed to be cut back and cut it back by the time of the um, inquiry. So had there been uh, a proper attempt to anal analyze it in accordance with Glivia guidelines, had that cutting back and the potential for winter and um, summer views been taken properly into account, uh, then that uh, awkwardness wouldn't have occurred. And indeed, um, it was very awkward at the inquiry because when I cross-examined the officer from the London Borough of Lambeth on it, he accepted that he'd relied entirely on uh, the screening in producing his report that um, it was, as he accepted, a material omission from the officer's report. Uh, not to have dealt with it in the terms uh, that he had. And I remember putting to the historic environment uh, witness in that case that he had, um, by assessing in the way that he had in the HTVIA, uh, set a hair running which had, had resulted in uh, infecting the entire public authority decision making process. And it was not a comfortable moment um, for anyone to have that question asked. Um, and it could easily have been avoided if a proper assessment had been conducted earlier. And the second example um, from that inquiry was that um, obviously Westminster Square within the immediate setting of the Palace of Westminster and the World Heritage Site um, is very, very carefully protected, in particular the silhouette of the palace. And um, there had been a failure properly to run the simulation, which meant that at one point um, the 8 Albert Embankment building did very slightly protrude um, into the silhouette. Now, it wasn't a sufficient protrusion that Westminster would ever have raised um, an issue about it had it been pointed out at the application stage, um, but it was much more uncomfortable uh, for the question to have to be raised, why have you not explained whether or not it's visible at one point, and then for it to become apparent that there was one view uh, in which it was visible. So making sure that uh, you engage with stakeholders, including the relevant statutory consultees, and you use all of the available tools, including in particular um, assessing properly uh, strategic views and other important views with reference to the Glivia guidelines uh, and that you run the models um, and ensure that you understand the townscape impact is really a 101 uh, for delivering uh, good design. The second aspect of delivering it uh, is scrutiny and review uh, and of course design review panels are one of the optimum uh, ways of achieving that because you get feedback from independent people which can then be fed in 
uh, to the design process as appropriate. And also you have an objective uh, view upon which you can uh, rely in front of the local planning authority or on appeal uh, as necessary. Um, I have now been involved in a number of cases, either where the design review panel's recommendations have been ignored um, or where a case hasn't gone through design review, even though there's a policy requirement to do so. Um, and the, the case for the development in those instances is very much weaker. Uh, it's very much easier for me as the advocate for the local authority um, to attack than in circumstances where a design review report has been produced, it's been considered, uh, and a, a thoughtful response to that design review uh, has come forward. Uh, the most notable uh, aspect, I think, of scrutiny, though, is, is internal scrutiny, making sure that what's being proposed uh, actually works. And um, two examples of that that I can think of. The first uh, was in the Camberwell Union case, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. Um, one of the one of the issues that was faced in that case um, was that the rooms were actually ever so slightly beneath, uh, in a number of instances, uh, the minimum space standard. And the response by the architect was, oh, that's fine, we can just thin the walls down and it will meet the minimum space standard. Um, but the inspector was extremely unimpressed. And when you're promoting a building as an example of high, high quality design, of excellent design, the last thing you want to say is, well, actually, we've slightly, uh, we've, we've designed the rooms as being slightly too small, but we'll thin the walls down to make that all right. It just um, looks bad. Um, but worse, I think, than that was a case I recently did uh, in Guildford, a game which I'll talk about soon, the Guildford Quadrant, where it emerged uh, in the course of the inquiry um, that the plans for the building uh, were such that ultimately it was not possible um, to build a um, a habitable building in accordance with those plans. There were issues with um, disabled access, with fire escapes, um, with flood routes, uh, and indeed with um, the location of things like flood water storage, which had just not been uh, properly thought through by the architects and which meant that the building was utterly unworkable. And so although um, it sounds like a truism to say, well, of course, design scrutiny is important to ensure good design. In fact, um, the number of cases where that scrutiny internally and externally doesn't take place and it severely impacts upon uh, the ultimate prospects of successfully consenting a building uh, are relatively extraordinary. Um, before I move on from good design, I just finally want to deal with the concept of um, design excellence. Uh, and it's worth noting that the framework, of course, essentially has an exception um, or used to have an exception for design excellence, which is now simply um, a provision of great weight to outstanding and innovative designs. Uh, and I do think that um, that provision is, or that paragraph of the framework is sometimes uh, overused. There are very few buildings which can legitimately claim to be um, of outstanding or innovative design. Um, a case recently, which I was involved in, where that point was being made and my client Westminster didn't necessarily accept it, um, was in relation to the Holocaust Memorial building proposed uh, next to the Palace of Westminster. That, of course, really is uh, a statement building designed by uh, Sir David Adjai, amongst others. Um, and the case being put uh, in terms of uh, design quality was that that was a building which would inevitably be listed uh, in due course. And I think that that really is the sort of standard that one needs to be uh, looking at when one seeks to promote as an exception uh, a design of outstanding quality. Uh, often, all too often, that paragraph is sought to be applied to, to buildings where, frankly, it looks slightly farcical um, to suggest that a relatively ordinary London vernacular development uh, is an example somehow of outstanding or uh, innovative design. The next uh, section or tranche of policies that I want to consider in the new London plan are the detailed design policies. Those are D5, D6, D7, and D8. Uh, and they all really interrelate to one another. Uh, the building that you can see on the right there is another that's not going to be built. That's the uh, Camberwell Union proposal. It was a major London redevelopment proposal for a new cultural quarter uh, down in Camberwell in Southeast London. Um, and it was a building which in many ways failed to, um, or a suite of buildings, which in many ways failed to appreciate the importance uh, of the details of the little things uh, when you design uh, a set of buildings. And ultimately it fell down on that. As I've already mentioned, one issue was that um, without thinning the walls out, some of the units did not meet minimum space standards. Um, but another issue 
and which I thought was um, particularly surprising was the approach taken uh, to the provision of uh, internal and out, uh, it, or the provision, provision of outdoor space uh, for each of the units because the approach taken had essentially been an averaging approach where each unit um, was said to meet the minimum space standard because on average there was uh, a total amount of open space divided by a total number of units um, which met the minimum space standard. The problem with that was that there were one or two um, penthouse flats with extraordinarily large outdoor spaces, huge terraces, um, at least in one instance, which was bigger than one of the communal outdoor spaces provided. Uh, and so, of course, if you do an averaging approach, um, you're taking uh, that huge individual outdoor space and essentially suggesting that you can divide it by uh, all of the other units, which is we I acted for the London Borough of Southwark because we uh, argued in that case, and I think it was essentially accepted by the Secretary of State, is a sort of Sheriff of Nottingham uh, approach to design, because what you are doing there is taking from the poorest, the people with the least outdoor space, uh, very often those are the affordable units, uh, and attributing uh, to the biggest, uh, the huge penthouse flat with a very, very large roof terrace, um, which is going to massively benefit. Um, from that averaging approach at the expense uh, of ensuring that all of the units uh, meet the space standards uh, that they are expected to. So I do think um, taking care with detailed design, unit by unit, making sure that everything uh, works, that the development is a, a happy, healthy place for people to live, uh, is something that's sometimes overlooked uh, by um, designers and which can ultimately lead to the downfall of of huge schemes like the Camberwell Union, which I think was a sort of half billion uh, pound scheme. The final aspect of uh, the new London plan uh, design suite of policies that I want to talk about uh, is the tall buildings policy. Uh, and there are really three aspects to it. Uh, the first is the definition of a tall building. And what's interesting about that is of course that it's contextual. Although there's a minimum height, that's six stories or 18 meters, um, what makes a tall building in New London plan terms is uh, its relationship to its context, how much taller it is uh, with reference to its context. And the example we can see uh, on the left here, I think rather illustrates that. That's the proposed redevelopment of the Holiday uh, Inn on the Cromwell Road um, that's going to be going to a planning inquiry um, this summer. It's a case which I've been involved with now for some two years have been two successful judicial reviews by my client, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in relation to it. Uh, and it's finally going to go to inquiry uh, this summer. But what's notable, I think, in that picture is the difference in scale uh, between the building proposed, which will be the very tallest in that part of London, as against uh, an ordinary um, five or six storey West London uh, townhouse, which when you're at ground level itself seems um, relatively high. So tall building is contextual. The second thing to note about the new London plan, tall buildings policy, and perhaps the most important, uh, is that it makes clear that tall buildings can only be developed in locations that are identified in a suitable development plan in accordance with that policy. And what that means is that uh, developers, designers need to be promoting their sites as allocations for tall buildings before they get uh, down the line uh, and find themselves at inquiry. And of course, very often that will be dealt with um, because there will be zones, uh, opportunity areas, etc., within boroughs which have been identified as suitable for tall buildings. But it's really important if you want to be arguing for accordance with D9 tall buildings policy, uh, that you are within a plan led location. The, the new London plan tall buildings policy very much gives uh, the power to the boroughs to determine appropriate locations uh, and makes clear that if you are not within an uh, allocated location within the plan, uh, then you are going to not accord with D9. That's not, of course, to say um, that you couldn't accord with uh, the development plan read as a whole. Uh, and it's also not to say that there might not be reasons for promoting in a particular site. Uh, and indeed, I think that's where the impact policy um, would come into play, even if you aren't in accordance with the locations aspect of the policy, uh, the visual, functional, environmental and cumulative effects of the development need uh, carefully to be considered uh, and assessed. And I think that goes back to a lot um, of what I've already uh, said. So uh, 
before I close, I just want to deal with a case study. And it is, I think, um, a cautionary tale of how not to promote uh, major development. It relates to the Guildford Quadrant, uh, a case uh, on which I have now twice been to a planning inquiry. And on both occasions, the appeal was withdrawn before the inquiry closed. Uh, the first iteration of the scheme you can see there, um, this is a proposal for a uh, demolition and rebuild of a substantial part of a conservation area uh, in Guildford uh, city centre. Um, that building that you can see had uh, no pre-application consultation whatsoever, was not submitted to design review, was promoted without any townscape analysis at all having been undertaken, uh, didn't in any way consider how it impacted on key views, uh, and had an internal and external layout which simply didn't really work in terms of things like cycle parking and you can see that there's a pedestrian route through um, that just screams um, unsafe at night. Uh, and finally, its height had been determined without any contextual analysis at all. It was simply, well, uh, and this came out in cross-examination, well, my client said he wanted this number of units. This was the size of site that we had. So uh, I designed the building up to the height that I did. Um, and indeed, one of the most awkward moments in cross-examination I've ever seen, uh, the architect, if I can call him that, of that building, uh, admitted um, in the course of cross-examination that he uh, had never designed a building which had been constructed uh, in any country in the world, let alone uh, had he uh, designed a building which had been granted planning permission in the United Kingdom, uh, which was a fairly painful revelation given um, the very good, very powerful uh, design evidence of Amanda Reynolds' uh, AR urbanism uh, against the scheme that we promoted. So given the issues that that scheme had faced, you would have thought perhaps that um, a better proposal uh, would be forthcoming. Um, better perhaps, but not very much so. You see it on the right hand of this slide. Um, this was the second attempt uh, at a building uh, proposal for this site, and it had no design review, uh, sorry, it had no pre-application consultation. It did have some design review involvement, um, but helpfully the design review panel report uh, was not disclosed. Now, it's very easy uh, to cross-examine and indeed to make a submission on the basis that the reason you're not disclosing the design review panel report is because uh, it undermines uh, your proposal that this is uh, good design. Again, uh, the height of the building didn't in any way seem to be based on uh, contextual analysis. It was more or less entirely uh, driven uh, to maximize the number of units and to provide the um, glass lantern effect uh, on top. Uh, its form as a building in no way really related to its function. I mean, in many ways, what you look at there looks like an office block, but in fact, um, it's proposed to be, or it was proposed to be student uh, accommodation. And things like having glass curtain walling and student study bedrooms uh, are inherently uh, incompatible. And it resulted in uh, painful last minute suggestions that that glass curtain walling should be um, blacked out painted. Um, not the sort of thing that suggests a high quality design uh, approach has been taken. And then perhaps uh, most amusingly, and it's only a small thing, but it, it was terribly amusing uh, at uh, inquiry when it emerged. Uh, there was a suggestion that the metal band that you can probably just about see beneath the um, brick slip facing uh, was a reference to the listed uh, now Weatherspoons buildings uh, metal run uh, through the centre of the building. The trouble is that there is no um, metal bar that runs through the centre of that uh, Weatherspoons building. It's the Rodborough building in Guildford. Um, and what they were actually referring to um, was just the um, wooden fascia with the advertising slogan on it. So it just suggested that whoever had come up with the design of that building had barely been on site and hadn't even looked uh, at the adjacent building, which is an extremely painful position to be in when you're promoting a scheme of that size uh, at a planning inquiry. Um, but that the building again um, was one where it had not been subject to scrutiny. And indeed that was a case where as a result of um, failures in relation to disabled access and floor level, uh, the building was of such poor quality and following two uh, or more or less two hours of cross-examination, not by me of the architect, but by the inspector who insisted that the architect be called out of order to answer his questions. Um, 
the uh, the proposal was withdrawn. So it really is a, a cautionary tale on how not to promote um, major development uh, in design terms. Uh, by way of summary, then, there are really four key points that emerge, uh, I think, from what I've said. The first is that there has been a shift in emphasis in policy terms to, towards demanding design excellence. Uh, the third is that beauty is no longer a dirty word in planning, and actually it's something that um, it's clear from the thrust of national and uh, London policy should be designed in. The third is that design needs to be plan led from the start. There are almost invariably going to be development plan policies which need to be taken into account right at the start of conceptualizing the design for a development. And the fourth is that active stakeholder engagement, including um, with statutory consultees, contextual analysis and careful scrutiny by design review uh, and internal scrutiny are critical uh, to ensuring the success uh, of a building. I'll just have a look and see if any questions have come through in the course of this. I've got uh, at least one or two in the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure how to open it. Uh, so the first question I've got is, are decision makers in planning process qualified to comment on design and can good design be seen as subjective and hard uh, to quantify? Well, I think um, the, the first point to make is that, of course, planning decision makers, uh, by and large, are local planning authority committees, uh, and they undoubtedly are qualified to comment on design. They are democratically elected individuals, not um, qualified in um, any form of town and country planning formally, but with the good sense and local knowledge that the courts uh, repeatedly refer to. Uh, and indeed, I, I can't think of anyone better, really, to consider the quality of um, a design uh, of a building proposed than the people democratically elected to represent uh, the inhabitants of that location. When you go up the chain uh, within the inspectorate, undoubtedly, I think um, there is the expertise there. A number of the planning inspectors that I've been before are architects uh, in their own right. Uh, and of course, uh, at all levels, um, there is normally going to be design evidence presented. I think one thing that is interesting um, is that very often local planning authorities don't uh, have a specific design witness. Um, and I have certainly found that that um, makes life more difficult for them when they're arguing about um, a design aspect of a proposal. Uh, but having said that, I have found um, that a number of local authorities uh, now do have the relevant in-house expertise. They do have uh, qualified uh, town planners who are also architects who can talk very much to questions of design, architectural quality and townscape, or they can employ an external consultee. And I've, as I said, worked, for example, uh, with Amanda Reynolds at AR, um, and she has done, I know, a number of schemes where she has succeeded in um, resisting appeals against refusals for um, major tall buildings uh, development, uh, including, I know, the um, London Legacy Corporation site and the Guildford Quadrant site with uh, me. Um, so in relation to the first aspect of that question, I think certainly um, the expertise is there. The second aspect of the question is, can good design be seen as subjective and hard to quantify? I think um, to some degree that's true. There's inevitably going to be beauty being in the eye of the beholder. Um, but I hope that as is clear from the, the policy suite that we've looked at and the various principles that apply, um, it is possible to come up with objective uh, approaches to design. And the thing I think that's most important in that regard is really contextual analysis. It's understanding um, the nature and character of an area which can be relatively objectively understood and responding to that appropriately. Um, right, let me see if I can find another question. I've got three, but I'm struggling to get them to show up. Here we are. Um, so I've got one from uh, Tobias Paul. Hi, Tobias. Uh, on the Commission's approach to ugliness, how should we approach uh, buildings such as St Peter's Ceremony, Seminary uh, Cardross, which is category A listed, but arguably uh, fails in all three of the heads, acceptability and so on. I confess that I'm not um, familiar with St Peter's uh, Cemetery Cardross, um, but it does seem to me um, that if a building is um, unable to meet each of those uh, 
adaptability uh, and so forth criteria, um, it's unlikely to meet uh, the third requirement of the Commission's um, criteria for good design, uh, namely being a sustainable building uh, for the future. Having said that, of course, there will always be cases where a building is a one-off, a sui generis uh, building, uh, which is not uh, ugly. And I mean, I suppose an example of that would be the Holocaust uh, Memorial Building, if you like the design of it and various other monuments. And um, I mean, I'm thinking also of the um, Museum of Modern Architecture just outside um, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. That's undoubtedly a building uh, which sort of looks like a spaceship, which which is of its own type and only going to be useful uh, as an art gallery. But nevertheless, um, I do think that, um, that that it's likely to be not seen as an ugly building. I think often ugliness probably is something uh, which really just needs to have the elephant test applied to it. Um, you know, it's very difficult to describe what an elephant is, but you do know one when you see one. Uh, another question I've got here from Philip in Chambers, which says, how easy or difficult do I see it as being in the future to refuse planning permission on design grounds for an average or OK building uh, where you haven't got a conservation area to justify it? I think the short uh, answer to that, Philip, is that I do think it's possible to refuse um, planning applications for uh, average buildings on the basis that their design uh, is poor if their design is poor. I mean, obviously, it will always depend on context. And you've said if you haven't got a conservation area there to justify it. Conservation area certainly raises the bar in terms of the design requirement. But if you're developing, for example, a green field even, um, if the quality of the design is not there, then it's very difficult, I think, um, to justify granting permission in circumstances where the framework makes clear that poor design should be refused permission. Uh, if what you have is, is adequate design, um, then, of course, it will always, uh, as anything does in planning, turn on the uh, pros and cons, the pluses and minuses, uh, the benefits and harms of the development. But um, overall, my view is that where you have um, sort of a, 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 an average to poor building uh, that can genuinely be said to be poorly designed, um, that is sufficient to sustain a reason for refusal. And indeed, um, the London uh, Legacy Development Corporation case on, I think it was Pudding Lane recently, was a case with a single reason for refusal design, not in a conservation area, um, but uh, essentially uh, overbearing scale, uh, bulk and mass. And that was sufficient uh, for planning permission to be refused on appeal. Um, right, well, I think I've uh, slightly gone over my time uh, now, and I'm hopeful that I've addressed uh, all of the questions that have been uh, are. So on that basis, it simply falls to me uh, to say thank you very much to everybody for watching and to wish you uh, a good afternoon. Thank you.